The Audi TT is one of the most recognisable cars on the road, so keeping it fresh and relevant but not straying too far from that distinctive, iconic original is a challenge for Audi. In 2005, they launched the second generation. They improved the power and the driving dynamics, but even still, the driving never quite matched those supermodel good looks. Now for the third generation, it promises to be sportier and more efficient. The TT comes in Sport or S line and it's available with two engines. You can choose the 2 litre 230 BHP petrol engine or the 2 litre 184 diesel engine. This is the diesel variant and it has the six speed manual gearbox. It's priced at 50,000, now there's 4,000 euros worth of extras on this car so that brings the price to 54,000. It does a very respectable 0 to 100 in 7.1 seconds and in terms of fuel economy it returns 4.2 litre is much lighter and the centre of gravity has been lowered and it really shows on the road. Despite the fact that this is a front wheel drive version, it grips the road really well, it's beautifully responsive, it corners with ease and this manual gearbox is particularly slick. Also Audi has a new progressive steering and it delivers just the right amount of feedback and weight when needed. Disappointingly though, the latest incarnation of the TT is a truly modern car that is packed with technology and if you liked the previous version you will love this one. It will still also be the car of choice of the fashion conscious buyer but I'm not convinced in this guy's diesel and front wheel drive that Audi have actually delivered a TT that is as good to drive as it is to look at but one thing they have done is they've taken a good car and made it even better. Geraldine Herbert for Independent.ie Build as a sports car of the future, the BMW i8 is simply stunning and there are few cars around that will attract so much attention. But underneath this sleek and sophisticated silhouette is a hybrid system that is so economical it will make your lawnmower look thirsty. But this begs the question, can anything this economical really drive like a sports car? It feels incredibly light and the steering is really light. The second thing is the noise. Most of the noise that actually is generated is artificially generated. It's almost like a supercar soundtrack, but it sounds just what you hoped a car that looks this good will actually sound like. The i8 is obviously a hybrid, so it works on the basis of the front wheels and to the back there's a 1.5 three-cylinder tiny pave. Then what you also have is a tiny motor that acts as a generator. So the default, you're not even aware of this, it just switches seamlessly. You can also drive up to 120 kilometers just on electric power. But if you flick it into sport mode, what you get then is the full resources of the car. So that's 357 bhp, over 500 newton meters of torque. And that's enough to propel this car from 0 to 100 in 4.4 seconds. Now, Ferraris and Lamborghinis will go faster than that, but none of them will do the fuel figures that this will do. According to BMW, this car returns 2.1 litres per 100. Now that's 135 miles to the gallon with 49 grams of CO2. They're typically normal BMW. It's got the same balance, the same poise that you'd expect from a BMW, but there's also a quality that is unlike anything else I've ever driven. I don't know what I was expecting from the i8, but it has exceeded all expectations. And there's just something about it that feels like nothing else on the road. It is really, really impressive. And I think I'm actually going to hold on to this car. But the i8 is not for everyone. The price is eye-watering. The rear seats are redundant and the boot is ridiculously small. And then there's the doors. They require so much space to open that they really are the most impractical thing about this car. But none of this is what the i8 is about. It is a futuristic sports car that is crowned with cutting-edge technology and it's destined to be the gene pool from which all future cars draw inspiration. At a time when so many are clamouring for lower emissions and greater efficiency, the i division of BMW have produced a car that not only guarantees the sustainability of the sports car but the fun to drive future. Geraldine Herbert for Indif Citroen has charmed us through the years with quirky design and innovation and now with this their new C3 they're back to what they do best but this is a car that will face some serious competition competition from the likes of the Volkswagen Polo, the Renault Clio, Peugeot's 208 and the Opel Corsa. On top of that, Ford is about to launch an all-new Fiesta this summer. So with radical styling, is the Citroen C3 as exciting as it looks? Engine choices for the petrol are a 1.2 three-cylinder petrol. Now you can get this in various forms. There's a 68, an 82 and a 110 bhp. However, if you do a lot of driving, you might want to opt for a diesel. There is a 1.6 turbo diesel. Now, the most powerful produces 100 bhp. This, our test car, has 75 bhp with 230 newton meters of torque. It does a taxi and there's enough poke in it to be entertaining on the road and it also sounds quite good. It's a very impressive 3.6 
uh, litres per 100. So that's about 78.5 miles to the gallon. And see it cars that are comfortable to drive, and the C3 certainly doesn't disappoint. It has a smooth ride, it's with trims, touch, feel, and flare. Now, the entry level petrol, the 1.2, starts at 15,490, the diesel at 17,890. This is the top of the range. 75 bhp 1.6 diesel and it has an urban red trim as extra so the price for this one is 20,000. Well it's not the most dynamic in its class and there's not much in the way of feedback from the steering also it's a little cramped in the back but all of that. The C3 is fun and quirky and Citroen have certainly injected some French flair and character into the small car market and while it's a car that won't excite with a dynamic drive it will certainly tempt with great comfort and affordable price tag and distinctive styling. Geraldine Herbert for independent.ie. The fastest growing segment in the car market today is for compact SUVs and Lexus are anxious to tap into this lucrative niche with their new NX but at the premium end of the market cars such as Audi's Q3, the BMW X3 and the Range Rover Evoque dominate so the NX has to be pretty special to stand out from this crowd. NX use a similar system to the IS300H so you've got a 2.5 four-cylinder petrol engine and an electric motor. Now this car comes in all-wheel drive or front-wheel drive and with the all-wheel drive version you get a second electric two emissions of just 116 grams and fuel economy of five litres per 100 or 56 and a half miles per gallon. Even on the all-wheel drive you get CO2 emissions of 121 grams which again is very very small and fuel economy of 5.3 litres or 53 miles to the gallon. The NX range starts at 43,000 and goes right up to just under 58,000 euros for the top of the range. Now, if you're comparing entry level price, just entry level price directly with competitors and not equipment, the available in six trims and this is the executive trim. Now, the difference with the executive trim is it's the only one that you can actually specify in either front wheel drive or all wheel drive. And this is the front wheel drive version and it comes in at 50,950. On the road, the NX comes into its own in terms of cruising. It is absolutely refined and beautiful as a cruiser. It doesn't, however, have the driving dynamics of something like the X3 or the Range Rover Evoque, but it is responsive at bends, it's very easy to drive, and the steering is nicely weighted. The biggest very competitive niche, Lexus have produced a blend of comfort and luxury that will appeal to a wide market. With the NX, Lexus may not have put the sport back into sport utility vehicle and keen drivers may look elsewhere, but the NX is better equipped and more efficient than many of its rivals and provides a Berlin Herbert for independent. It has 129 bhp and it does not 108.3 seconds with a top speed of 204 kilometers. Now on paper that doesn't sound very fast, but remember faster. Also, the Mazda MX-5 is not about power or speed, it's about balance and it has a really even improved the handling from the previous version. It just grips the road perfectly and the steering is perfectly honed. Also, a really nice addition is this six-speed manual gearbox. It is super slick. Now, the Roadster comes in two versions. The basic version is 27,995 and the GT version is 29,995. In terms of economy, according to Mazda, you'll get 6.1 litres per watt a year. The roof is very simple to operate. It's through this latch system here. You just literally pull it and push it down. It can be done as you sit in the driver's seat and it takes about three seconds to complete. So what are the downsides of this car? Well, first of all, it's noisy. The noise comes right through, either with the roof down or the roof up. You can really notice that engine noise. The second thing is with the roof up, it feels quite cramped. Given the fact that in Ireland we have about 238 rain days a year, if you're gonna drive one of these cars, that's gonna be a constant feature, meters, so you're not gonna be traveling very far. If you think all small city cars look the same, then think again. This is the Adam Rocks, and Opel reckon it's the only three-door crossover of its size and type. Essentially what they've done is they've taken their Adam, the city car, and given it a chunkier and more muscular look, and it now looks like nothing else on the road. It also comes with a host of personalization options to ensure that no two Adam Rocks will ever look the same. It bode well for the Adam Rocks, but surprisingly it's very good. It handles much better on the road than the standard Adam, and the suspension just soaks up rumps really nicely. Under the bonnet is a one litre turbocharged petrol engine that is very fast, lively and very refined. Even idling you can barely hear it. Despite the fact that it's only three cylinders, it has 115 bhp and 170 newton metres of torque. So it packs a serious punch and manages to go from 0 to 100 in 9.9 seconds. It has a top speed of 196 km. It does 5.1 litres per 100 and has CO2 emissions of 119. So motor tax is 200 a year. Now there is the option of a 1.4 petrol in the Adam Rocks, but really the one litre one is the one to go for. 
Another feature of this car is the electronically operated canvas roof. It's simple to use and it can actually be operated at speeds of up to 140 kilometers an hour, which is very handy for those sudden downpours. Also, when it reclines, it has absolutely no impact on rear visibility or on boot space. Okay, so the boot space brings me to the negatives in this car. The boot space currently is 170 litres. Now, that's small enough, but also that it's a very narrow opening, so it actually makes it very difficult to fit anything into it. The rear space is bad as well. You'll fit kids into it, but just only barely. And then there's the price. The Opel Adam Rock starts at 18995 Now, that does seem expensive for a city car, and its closest rival is the Fiat 500C, which comes in at 2500 less. However, and even the standard Mini comes in at 19900 So it's not that expensive when you put it in perspective like that. This car is all about image and it's clearly aimed at the fashion conscious who want to stand out from the crowd. And yes, there are issues with it. The price is high, the rear space in the back is tight and the boot is pretty small. But fitted with the one litre engine, it really is fun to drive. It's not going to be to everyone's taste. But I reckon when it comes to style, Opel have finally produced an Adam that actually does rock. Geraldine Herbert for Independent.ie Space, stylish looks and cheap running costs are the main criteria for the success of a small car and the Opel Corsa has been a popular choice, selling more than 12 million since it first launched in 1982. This is the new fifth generation Corsa and while it's not technically a brand new car, it is far more than just a mere facelift. It has new engines, chassis. There's a good range of engines to choose from with the new Corsa, but the pick of the bunch is definitely the all-new 1.0-litre three-cylinder turbo unit. It has 115 bhp and goes from 0 to 100 in 10.3 seconds. There's also a new six-speed manual gearbox that goes along with it. The only issue is very expensive, 19,395, and this puts it out of the reach of most Corsa buyers. However, if you're looking for a petrol engine, there is also the 1.2 with 70 bhp to choose, or the one that's fitted to this car, the 1.4 with 90 bhp. This car comes in at 16,495. It has 120 CO2 emissions, so it's 200 euros a year to tax, and it returns 5.2 litres or 54 miles per gallon. If it's diesel you're after, there's a 1.3 diesel which has 75 bhp, and that starts at 16,395. The chassis for the Corsa has been completely redesigned, and the suspension now has a nice balance between comfort and performance. There is also much better insulation, so there's much less wind and road noise than before. A new steering is also in place. It's a speed sensitive steering, so essentially what it's supposed to do is it's light when you're in town and you're trying to park and maneuver, and then it, it actually weightens up very well equipped. Now you've got four trims to choose from. There's the entry level S, Excite, the SE, and then the top of the range limited edition. And even the basic entry level is, is fairly well equipped. You get things like remote central locking, electric front windows, and a tire pressure monitoring system. If you trade up to Excite, which is the next level and is actually the one on this car, you get things like the audio controls on the steering wheel, Bluetooth, front fog lights, LED running lights, and better car than the previous model. The handling has been improved, and it, while it's not as fun to drive as the Ford Fiesta, Generation Corsa may appear like a mere revamp, but it is far more than that. With options to choose from, such as petrol or diesel, manual or automatic, and a three-door or five-door, the Corsa is the one to consider for competitive pricing, space, and a very good range of models. Geraldine Herbert for Independent. When it comes to hot hatches, there are some key requirements. They need to be fast, responsive and balanced, but you're going to live with them on a day-to-day -day basis, so they also need to be reasonably comfortable. The Peugeot 308 GTI is the latest to be unveiled from the French car maker. So does it live up to that iconic GTI name and tick those hot hatch boxes? No charge petrol engine, so it's fairly remarkable how Peugeot managed to extract so much power from such a small engine. This is the more high powered of the two, the 270 bhp, and it goes from 0 to 100 in 6 seconds and does a top speed of 249 kilometres. Our test car also comes with larger but lighter wheels, bigger brake corner when you're cornering that it grips a little better. The idea behind it is that it sends torque to the wheel with the most traction, so therefore you can accelerate out of a bend much harder than you normally could. Now it works very effectively in dry weather, but when we got wet weather earlier in the week, I noticed you get a huge amount of wheel spin if you push the car too hard, so you do have to be careful. Now on the road the car is very comfortable, despite the fact that it's got very large wheels. It soaks up bumps really nicely. The ride is 
it's firm but it's never harsh it's you know it is it is a more comfortable car than anything else it is also very fast it's responsive and that grip is really nice it's very well balanced the gearbox is a six speed manual gearbox now it could be slightly slicker but you know it's decent enough if you press the fuel economy uh, co2 emissions are 139 so you're going to be paying 280 euros in motor tax a year now Peugeot reckon you'll do about six liters per 100 or 47 miles to the gallon so that's fairly decent for a performance car but what about the downsides in the car? Well, the biggest downside for me is the steering. It's just very dull and lifeless. And it's such a pity because it's a really nice car to drive. As I said, it's fast, it's responsive. Got some more feedback from the steering. The second is an awful lot of time with your eyes off the road just trying to figure it out. HP 308 GTI start at 37,175. 3,175. Rivals include the Seat Leon Cooper with 290 brake drive. Peugeot have produced some pulse racing cars in their time, cars like the 205 GTI, one of the very best hot hatches of the 80s and 90s. So with so much racing DNA, it should come as no surprise that they can still deliver a seriously good hot hatch. But hot hatches are a delicate balance between performance and comfort. And in this case, rivals probably provide a more engaging drive. But there are few hot hatches that are quite as easy to live with as this one. Geraldine Herbert for Independent.ie. If practicality, economy and style is what you're looking for in a family car, then look no further than this, the all-new Volkswagen Passat. Since 1973, 22 million have been sold. In fact, a new Passat finds a home every 29 seconds. New for 2015 is more technology, smarter styling and better engines. And all round it is a more sophisticated offering, so much so that Volkswagen are intent on taking a slice of the premium car market. Highline specs, so you get some nice extras like adaptive cruise control, leather seats, heated front seats and rear windows that are tinted. Underneath the bonnet is a 2 litre diesel and this produces 190 bhp and it's a really punchy engine. It also is mated to this beautiful silky smooth DSG gearbox which is a semi-automatic gearbox. As always with Volkswagen, there's a huge range of engines to choose from, but if you want to go for the one that has the best fuel economy, it's the 1.6-120 bhp. It produces almost 70 miles to the gallon, which is 4.9 litres, and it has CO2 emissions of as low as 104. It also does 0 to 100 in a respectable 10.8 seconds, so it's a really nice blend of performance. And now, interestingly, the one that's the 150 bhp, the more powerful one, is actually the more economical, and that's because it utilises Volkswagen's active cylinder technology and essentially what this does is it shuts down two of the cylinders when they're not being used price. However, when you compare it to rivals, it is actually quite competitive. The Passat estate starting price is 22,297,595 and their 2 litre diesel is 29,595. On the road, this car is really nice to drive. It's very responsive, the steering is sharp and it handles really well. Yes, it could be more fun to drive, but I don't think that's what the Passat is about. The Passat is about delivering hundreds or thousands of stress-free miles and not thrills on back roads. Crossovers and SUVs may have decent space and practicality to warrant credentials as the ideal family car, but if you need a load lugger, there is nothing better than an estate. The trump card of the Passat estate is its sheer refinement and quality. It gives rivals a serious run for their money. But whether Volkswagen have done enough to lure buyers away from BMW, Mercedes-Benz or Audi remains to be seen. Geraldine Herbert, Independent.